particular questions for the panel. Tonight we're joined by Henry McLeish, Labour's Deputy Leader in Scotland. He's hoping for victory next week, but as a former footballer, he'll be all too aware of the danger of an own goal tonight. David Steele is a former Liberal leader and a veteran in the battle for devolution. Despite enduring the Commons and the Lords, he wants into another Parliament. But at least he's not lording it over as in this election he's playing David Steele in the campaign. Annabel Goldie is the Deputy Leader of the Conservatives. She will be hoping to use her skills, honed as Vice Chairman of the Salvation Army, to lead the Tories out of the wilderness. John Swinney is the Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party. He claims to be a financial magician, conjuring up the idea of a penny for Scotland. But he hopes this trick won't make the votes disappear. We can take the first question now, and it comes from Gerry Keegan, who's a member of the Labour Party. Good evening. With just six days to go to the election, why have the SNP still not told us how they are going to pay for the 70 manifesto commitments outlined in their document? Putting up taxes by one pence will only raise so much. Can we expect taxes to go up much further? John Sweeney. Well, one thing's absolutely certain about this election campaign, the SNP has been centre stage, and I'm glad to see we open tonight's programme with a centre stage again. Uh, the SNP has put forward a very detailed manifesto for the Scottish Parliament elections that relates to the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Every single manifesto commitment that is in that manifesto has been costed by the SNP and we've come forward with an initiative to guarantee that there is more resources put into Scottish public services, £690 million from our Penny for Scotland initiative. Now, the Labour Party has tried this trick. They've tried to say that there are manifesto commitments that we haven't costed, but we've taken every one of their 70 charges and rebutted every single one of them. But John Sweeney, you're an economist. <clears throat> Would you trust anyone who made a policy up, a penny for Scotland, on the back of an envelope, well, hours after a budget? Well, what it's about is about recognising the choices that are in the finances of the of Scotland true, and the United would you, Kingdom. Would you take a policy made in the back of an envelope? Well, it's not a policy made in the back of an envelope at all. What it, what it is is a, a policy framed within the context of the budget choices made by the Chancellor. Now, the Chancellor told us that he had £2.5 billion pounds in the public finances that he could distribute for some purpose. So how quickly did you make that decision? I think the voters no, 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 want to know no, about the, the well, credibility no. of your uh, economic policies. How quickly, after Gordon Brown sat down, did you make the decision for a penny for Scotland? Well, the final, initiative that the, the final decision the SNP took about the Penny for Scotland initiative was taken democratically by our members at an annual conference in Aberdeen on no. the Saturday after the budget, where we no, had it was decided... Made before no, that. but we as a party democratically took that decision. And unlike the Labour Party, we take our orders in Scotland, we don't take them from London. Well, Henry McLeish, what is the point of having the ability to vary taxation if you are saying that heavier taxation is bad for Scotland that the SNP is irresponsible. Well, what we're saying, Kirsty, is simply this, that we put the Scottish variable rate in the Scotland Act. Scotland voted for it on September 11th in the referendum. That's absolutely right. And it is up for the parties to decide if they want to use it. What we are saying just now is that we've got an expenditure programme over the next three years of £4 billion in the key areas of education, health and housing. The Chancellor has got the finances absolutely sound. We have interest rates which are low, we have inflation which is low, and of course we're looking towards giving people a fair deal in Scotland. There's no point in helping Scots by hurting them, because the key issue in this election is when the Nationalists talk about a penny for Scotland. Remember, it's a hard hit of £250 for the average Scottish but, but, but taxpayer. But we simply don't think that is required. <laughs> to be damaging and yet Jim Stevens, who comes from this neck of the woods, exactly. who is on the national executive of the Labour Party and who is standing as a candidate, says it would not be damaging. A penny for Scotland would not be damaging. He's on your national executive. That, that's an opinion, Kirsten. I'm just basically so saying okay that we... So it's okay Well, it is a situation, it is a situation, John, um, where we're saying that with a four billion expenditure programme, with the Chancellor able to cut tax at the UK level by one pence, a starting rate of 10 pence for the lower paid. Surely that combination of sound finances, public investment and lower taxes, that's the way forward well, let's hear bit, Let's hear a bit from the audience now. Yes, the gentleman, the gentleman with respect and then the gentleman on the left hand side. First of all, yes. Yes, Hugh Kerr, member of the European Parliament and member of the Scottish Socialist Party. I think the real irony about the penny for Scotland is actually, it shows how trivial it is between the four main parties. The truth is that the rich in Scotland and the rich in Britain did extraordinarily well out of 18 years of Tory government 
and that we have the lowest taxes on the rich and the lowest corporation taxes of any country you, in Europe. Thank you very much. And the that real question for the Labour Party is why it's being so timid and adopting Tory public expenditure plans as it has done for the past two years. Thank you very much. The gentleman. Scotland needs investment in its public services, in its, in its houses, its schools, its hospitals. We must be prepared to put up tax in the short term to pay for that. The Green Party, for example, wants to eliminate um, the, the dire state of our housing. We, we need short-term investment for that. It's a simple, simple statement. A Annabelle Gordy, let's pick that up with you. Um, the Conservatives? particularly Peter Lilly, William Hague, Francis Maud are now talking about investment in public services, showing that the Conservative Party has a commitment to public services. Isn't what the gentleman saying right, that if you have to have taxes increased to pay for that, you should be prepared to increase taxes? I think it depends on assessment of the circumstances. I think what William Hague has been doing is absolutely right. The Conservative Party has always been committed to these services, but he felt the perception was different, and I applaud him for clarifying the position. But what mm. he also very rightly recognises is that if you, again, it goes back to this basic question of tax. Now, you can very easily kill the goose that lays the golden egg. And you do not have money for any expenditure on the public sector or anywhere else unless you have a buoyant, prosperous economy. You don't have that unless you have a general economic situation where business wants to be and new business wants to come. So it has to be, it has to be a question of generating a prosperous economy and that will provide the wealth for distribution to these areas which you are rightly so concerned about. Well, taxes played so far in this election is certainly going to pay in the next six days. We must move on now and take a question from Robert Graham from the Pro-Life Alliance. Robert Graham. Um, just in view of the fact that 12,000 unborn Scottish babies are killed by abortion every year as a, as a result of the 1967 Abortion Act, would the panel agree that control of abortion legislation should be devolved to the new parliament and that it would be of great credit to Scotland if the practice of abortion were outlawed and the right to life extended to all our citizens, including the unborn? A question, two parts, David Steele. Well, firstly, we, we had a debate on this in the, in the Lords, and uh, most of my party voted for the return of the legislation to Scotland. We don't see any case for having uh, this as a retained issue at Westminster. But that's been decided. I mean, that argument was lost, but the answer to your question is I would agree that it ought to be within the power of the Scottish Parliament. On the substance of the issue, of course, people tend to forget now, because we're in 1999, what life was like in 1967 and before, when we had a, a, an appalling record of criminal abortion, self-induced abortion, 30 to 50 women a year in the UK dying each year as a result of botched abortions, the public wards of every hospital clogged with women who are in there for uh, repair for incomplete, septic and incomplete abortion it was called. All that's been removed. Now you may disagree with abortion, but if you're going to have abortion, all I'm saying is it's better to have it safe and legal than dangerous and illegal. Um. Um, the Scottish Parliament can decide on euthanasia. Technically, it can decide on the death penalty, though there are very many hoops to go through. But New Labour doesn't think the Scottish electorate can be trusted to deal with abortion policy. No, Kirsty. I mean, I think the issue is too serious for, for that kind of comment because but, certainly but in the House of Commons, the certainly in the House of Commons, when we were shaping the bill, and I was involved with uh, Donald Dewar before it went to David in the Lords, we thought long and hard about the issue. And why we decided to keep it as a reserve market at Westminster was to have a consistency of policy throughout the United Kingdom. Because we are part, of, we are part of the United Kingdom. We didn't want a situation where we were going to have cross-border traffic developing. Three. So in a sense, Kirsty, it was not a slight right, on the Scots. It was simply on medical and in, re in relation to this question of inter-country right. transfer. Let's, let's, just, let, well, let's just be quite clear on this. You say you want a consistency of policy between the Scottish Parliament and Westminster on, on this, this issue. issue. You don't mind if there's an inconsistency of policy on this and Westminster on euthanasia. That just absolutely doesn't seem well, coherent. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying, Kirsty, is because it's not an issue. It's not an issue. 
This was not looked upon as a political issue. It's far too serious. And I agree with David entirely about the reason why we've but got... But David wanted it back. But David no, still I, wanted I agree it back. With the, first, the second part of his answer... There wasn't, 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 wasn't a party issue. There wasn't a party issue. And that was crucially important. It was taken on what you might regard as narrow grounds, but to keep, to avoid cross-border traffic on something which could clearly develop. Now, it wasn't a political issue, it wasn't ideological, it wasn't a slight against Scotland. There was a long debate but within the government on that issue, and I think we've come up with the right solution. The issue, surely, because it already, there isn't parity across the United Kingdom as it is, so it was a political issue not to give it to the Scottish Parliament. No, you're talking about two issues. One is, if you're talking about facilities and um, that we have throughout the United Kingdom, they could vary in quality. That's a difference, Kirsty, from the point of view of saying that Scotland different should have a Northern different Ireland. set of laws from England, Wales, and, uh, and England, Wales on this issue. So I think the right decision was taken. But of course, what you have um, is a situation where if it's not ideological or political, it should be done on the basis of sound technical reasons. I think that was the right decision. Annabelle Goldie, um, the Conservatives also wanted to be a power uh, for the Scottish Parliament. But are you sure that a Scottish Parliament would have made abortion more restrictive than it is now? Are you sure they would have taken automatically a different line? Henry McKee seems to be concerned there would be a different line. I think that is a matter entirely for the Scottish Parliament. It's very difficult to Unfortunately, it's not. Well, it's very difficult to predict what their view would have been, Kirsty. And I think that in an area which is so sensitive as this one, and in respect of which people have so many deep and, and very cogent feelings, uh, I do feel it is important to understand why the law is there in the first place. I entirely endorse what David has said. I speak as a solicitor in Glasgow, and I have to tell you that before David's bill became law in the 1960s, the situation which existed was absolutely appalling, absolutely unacceptable, and I hope it is never repeated in this country. But, but, don't, you, but, but don't you also see an inconsistency with some of uh, the devolved powers and some of the reserved powers? And actually very, very strong moral issues, like euthanasia, can be discussed by MSPs. But abortion can't, I mean, there seems to be I no think, pattern. I think there is, in an, in an issue like this, uh, a certain need for consistency. I must be quite honest about that. And I do feel that Henry has a valid point when he says in relation to the United Kingdom, and you must remember that we have members of the medical profession who travel between Scotland and England. They have to observe the laws as it exists. They have to apply the laws as it exists. I think this is a very difficult area where I feel at the moment consistency <coughs> is extremely important. Well, before I come to John Swinney, I want to take some views from the audience. Young women at the back and then the young women on the other side. Thank you. Surely the members of the Scottish Parliament are here to represent the people of, Stuart, people of Scotland as choice. They want their choice. And is it right that people in Westminster should be de deciding whether people in Scotland should have abortions? Surely in hospitals, people in abortion clinics shows that the amount of people that want or need to have an abortion should be allowed to have it in Scotland and it should be decided in Scotland. Okay. <laughs> you from the woman on the other side, yes, you have... I think we should trust the Scottish electorate to be able to return a parliament that will enshrine a woman's right to choose. Thank and you And that much. should be within the remit of the parliament. Thank you very much. OK, come back to John Swinney. If abortion law was tightened in Scotland, wouldn't you be concerned about cross-border abortion trade, much as Henry McLeish is? Well, I think the, the issue is, is you know, to go back to the point about whether the, the Scottish Parliament should have province in this issue, is about the maturity of debate within the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish electorate. And, you know, I would choose for the Parliament in Scotland to be able to resolve many issues that are all of the reserved issues that are currently uh, retained by Westminster through an independent Scottish Parliament to give people in Scotland the choice over a whole range of policy areas. And I think we, um, by the, the way in which we elect the Parliament, by the way in which we conduct a mature debate in Scotland, we should be able to address these issues and to consider all of the factors which you rightly raise in your question, Kirsty, which are legitimate issues about uh, the potential for cross-border trafficking if there was a different legislative issue. That would be an issue for the Scottish Parliament to consider. It would be one of the factors that would have to be borne in mind before the Parliament took its final decision on that, that, that particular issue. So it's about trusting the Parliament and trusting the electorate to elect yeah. a Parliament that will act in its interests you, and the interests of the people of Scotland. Well, isn't that the case? You do, just don't trust the Scottish people. You have in your mind what might happen in the Scottish Parliament and therefore you deny it the chance to have no, that vote. No, not at all, Kirsty. I mean, because in a sense we could widen this debate this evening because we could talk about an area like drugs um, where the definition of what is a different class of drug will be a reserved matter at Westminster. Again, a huge debate around that. 
not one of Scotland versus England in terms of trust. They also have the, the situation in terms of, of guns. Because what we've got is an attempt to have consistency. And the Scotland Act, the Scotland Act, Kirsty, is an excellent document. It's a great balance of devolved and reserved matters. But on those issues, there was certainly never in, in, any intention to say Scots couldn't be trusted but to decide that, this issue. There, there were overwhelming arguments within the United Kingdom to keep the Do position. Do you think there was overwhelming was. arguments, David Steele? The, the, the one argument that the government put in both houses of Parliament when this was debated was that you could get an undesirable cross-border traffic. Supposing the law were, were restricted in Scotland, you'd have traffic down the way. If it was made more liberal, then that you'd have tra traffic coming the other way. But, uh, that now, happens now, in Northern Ireland well, already, David Steele. That's just what I was going to say, because there is some evidence that because uh, we get a lot of women coming over from Northern Ireland and from the Republic of Ireland, because their laws are tighter. So Henry's worry about that, the government's worry has some justification, but my argument with them is, do you think the Scots Parliament is so feeble that it wouldn't be able to take that into account from Premier yes, Law. Of course, they should be trusted to do it themselves. It shouldn't seem after West. But there, there, there. Thank you very much indeed. I just, I just wanted to have a quick word with the questioner and see what you made of people's replies. Very briefly, please. Well, I'm very disappointed with the uh, response of our panel, to be quite honest with you. I felt that the new Scottish Parliament was a real opportunity to do something radical, to set up a real radical institution away from the Westminster Parliament. And I feel that if we're going to have a soundly based Scottish Parliament, then it must be based on the right to life. That is the basis of all, of all human rights, is the right to life, and it must be based on that. If it's not, then I don't think it'll be a success. Thank you very much indeed. Now we can take a question. It comes from Charles Booth from the Scottish Green Party. Your question, please. The Scottish people were promised a new politics to, uh, to go with their new parliament. Instead, we've seen the same old characters rehearsing the same old arguments, um, in the same old aggressive Westminster style with backroom deals we've seen this week. Has anything changed? Henry McLeish. I think it has changed. I'm probably one of the old characters you're talking about in your, <laughs> in your question. But in the run-up to the, um, after the Scotland Act, we got together a consultative steering group which had all party representation. And that really set... Minus the Greens. Uh, my, apolo the Greens. my apologies for that. Um, but I think you would have concluded with us that the, the, the document was a very good one. It was about a new politics. It was about a blueprint for a parliament that would work differently from Westminster. It was about family-friendly hours. It was a horseshoe-shaped parliament. It was about electronic voting. So in that practical sense, we've set out a way that parliament in Edinburgh will be different. But secondly, I don't think we should judge what will happen after May the 7th with the kind of hurly-burly, the cut and thrust we see on the hustings uh, here in Scotland. There are a lot well, of passionate that's views, to that, there's then, a lot of passionate views, Kirsty, about issues, but I believe that the new parliament does provide a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make things different, and I have no reason to doubt that tonight every one of the panellists will say it will be different because Scotland's hopes are riding on it. Right, well, as a testament to that, this idea that there's going to be a new way, um, in the latest biography of uh, Peter Mandelson, the story of the 1996 meeting at the home of the current Lord Chancellor and part of the agreements that were reached at that meeting and Paddy Ashdown was there and Donald Dewey was there that uh, they would work towards a Lib Lab coalition in a Scottish Parliament in the event of no Labour majority. Is that true or not? It's completely, completely untrue and I think David, David, will, David will come in at the back of me and say <laughs> that uh, and I think that, that James Wallace said that he could rubbish it with all the skill that he could muster. I'm sure David will as well. <laughs> It's simply not the case. So this, I don't this, think we should be. I don't think we should be distracted, Kirsty, by uh, people talking to each other. There are no pacts. <laughs> no, no, we must there have are that. No <laughs> deals, there are no deals, and we face a situation where we, we are in this election to win as many seats as we can and have an overall majority. That is the aspiration but, of all the other parties. David, yeah. David, I know you're going to agree with Henry McLeish that a specific I do deal wasn't done. No, I do occasionally. I, I think probably more than I do. But I mean, you've always said that there has been in a sort of yes. romantic way, an understanding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look at me like that, Kirsty. How can I? <laughs> no. <laughs> the truth is, we published a document after these talks. Of course, there were discussions. There were discussions about constitutional change, including the program for getting the uh, legislation following the Constitutional Convention onto the statute book <coughs> early in the life of a new government if there was a change of government. We were quite open about it. We even published a document afterwards. So for the SNP to call them secret talks, you, if they were secret, we would never have published a document saying what we were going to do. What I can tell you absolutely is that those discussions never went on to say what would happen after 
people have voted in the Scottish elections. We can't say around this table what will happen because it is for the MSPs, once they're elected, to get together and discuss how to form a stable government. But I, I want to push you on this because you, of all, people, you, like, you of all people, are people that you, you were there when the Lib Lab pack came, yeah. came around. Uh, Jim Wallace has you know, <clears throat> not ruled out doing business with anybody. Of course not. But in an article in The Guardian, you were very hostile to the nationalists and you listed a whole variety of reasons why you couldn't work with them. No, no, no. I Is that still the case? I listed a variety of reasons why it was difficult to work with them, right? I mean, and, and, and the language one, one, one we've already discussed, which was how you can suddenly change the tax policy and tip within 10 minutes of the Chancellor sitting down. That makes it very difficult to work with a party, but it's not impossible. I analysed also how it could be difficult to work with the Labour Party. Uh, but these difficulties have got to be overcome. We've got a PR parliament. Nobody's likely to have an overall majority. The politicians have got to talk to each other, and that's why my answer to the question is politics is what's going to your, be different. Okay, what's Scotland. your personal preference in terms of someone to work with? Uh, I don't wish to choose between the two ugly sisters. I would rather have the Cinderella. Well, <laughs> Cinderella in terms of votes oh, might really? be the Conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of hands up here in the audience. And I'm going to come out to you straight away, but I just, I just want. Don't you think the Scottish electorate is entitled? Because this is a new politics. It no. is about coalition politics. It may well be. It may well not. Well, don't you think the electorate has got a, a right to say, if yes. I put my tick in the Liberal Democrat box, I what do want to know what you're what going to do. Well, I've told you what we're going to do. We're going to talk to whichever party is the largest number of seats in the Parliament. That's the correct democratic thing to do. Doesn't mean to say we have to do a deal with them, but that's the first thing that you do after the election. That's right, well, let's right take a variety of views from the audience. The young man down here, please. Yes. I don't think we should really be desperately surprised that the new politics hasn't come to fruition. After all, the SNP and Conservatives showed they had no stomach for cooperation when they took no part in the Scottish Constitutional Convention. Thank you very much. And the young woman with the, the lilac top in the front row. Yes, your question, please. Kirsty, it wasn't just about the coalition politics, it's also about new political parties getting elected to the Parliament. I'm from the Scottish Socialist Party and I've got to laugh at democracy, we initially got banned. But also, we've been given absolutely no access, us or the Greens or anyone else, and Tommy Sheridan is the most likely at the moment of any other party to get elected. Why not? I want to ask the politicians, wouldn't you prefer if some of the smaller parties, like the Scottish Socialist Party and the Greens, were invited onto the panels as an extension of democracy to break this four-party free market hold? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll, 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 maybe, well, maybe in a moment I'll be asking the other two parliamentarians whether they would work with your party, but let me take a view. The young man <laughs> in the white shirt, him? please, and the specs, yes. I would like to ask, is constitutional change really desirable for a new form of politics? If it's because, just going to be the same as the old form, you mean? Because proportional representation and a horseshoe-shaped parliament both bring to mind Weimar Germany. And we know what happened to that parliament, don't we? Right, thank you very much. And yes, can I have, uh, yes, the boy from Grange Academy and also the young woman at the top. Yes, your question, please. If the Labour Party really do have a new way for this new parliament, I don't think we've heard about it because their entire campaign, along with the Tory party, has been a negative campaign, <laughs> slurring the SNP rather than giving us information about their own, their own campaign. Right, well, let's just take the young woman up at the back just now. Yes, please. Um, the gentleman at the front mentioned that one of the objectives when drawn up the new constitution was that no party had an overall majority. I was just wondering if you see uh, PR as a fair representation of the Scottish people because PR gives heed to uh, coalition governments as we saw with Liberal Democrats at the beginning of this century and we've seen in many countries and it's always been a failure Thank because you, smaller parties aren't obviously aren't voting into the parliament because they're not the major choice. Well, thank you very much. Let's just turn to Annabelle Goldie because Conservatives were originally against PR, but PR actually might be your saving grace in the Scottish Parliament. Well, we take the comforts that are offered to us. <laughs> and, um, I'm still waiting for a letter of thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this is a system which has been created and of course as a political party in Scotland, we'll work with that system. And, and that's as the woman said in the front row, she would like to know whether you would work with People like the Socialist Labour Party, the Scottish Socialist Party, the Greens. No, I think what she did ask was, would we like her to be up on this platform? And uh, why, I have to say to you that just yesterday... Right, let's, let's wait talk a minute, about this, this lady has asked a very relevant question, and I think it should be dealt with. Only yesterday, I had a marvellous hustings meeting where I was one of seven, including your party, and it was the most lively affair imaginable. 
Annabel Goldie, um, tell me about the kind of politics that's, that's being um, promoted during this um, campaign. Because it may have been Labour that are setting the negative tone, as uh, we heard from the back there. But um, do you think the Conservatives have been negative? If I can just say some of the things you've been saying. Um, you put Alex Salmond as a Teletubby in La La Land. Um, you said Blair for Blair and FCUK tuition fees. And do you think this is the kind of campaign we should have from the Conservatives? Well, these are not so much campaigns no. as the medium. The, uh, the medium this is for negative the, campaigning. The, this is the, what you call the medium for the message. I think uh, what's extremely important... Not a message from a medium. Not a message from a medium, but what I think is terribly important is the message. And I did listen with interest to your point, because it came from a, a, a school pupil up there. You know, I just thought abolition of tuition fees, conservative initiative, would have been music to your ears. I really would have done. But it's the language I, people are concerned about. That is a positive policy commitment. I would have thought that our proposals for education in general would have been music to your ears. I would have thought that our whole approach to trying to improve the health service would have been music to your ears. And if you've got younger brothers and sisters, I would have thought the guaranteed place for four-year-olds of nursery right. education and would have been music to your ears. Before I move off you. This campaign, would you would you feel from your point of view as a conservative that negative campaigning is here to stay? No, I don't think so. Just in this election? I don't think so. I think you've got to acknowledge in politics, and this is one of the ironies of life. The four of us, believe it or not, are all wanting the same thing for Scotland. Oh, John Spinney. The four of us. The four of us are all wanting a good Scotland. We have different ways politically of thinking how we can achieve that. John Swinney, what about the kind of campaign? Well, people are out here saying is we want to see evidence of the new politics. But I think in any election campaign, uh, some tough things are going to be said and some tough campaigns are going to be operated. And I think uh, what parties have got to do is to put forward messages that they can be proud of at the end of the election campaign. I certainly will look back on this campaign and be very proud of the positive message the SNP has put forward. I think there will be a lot of people in the Labour Party asking themselves what on earth they've done in this election campaign, how they've destroyed some of the, the hopes of people in Scotland uh, in the duration of this election campaign. Now, what's Let important, me, what's it, what's it, back to no, wait, no, wait, no, you've made an attack on Henry McLeish. Henry McLeish. I don't negative think it, I don't campaigning, think it's a negative assisted campaigning. by the tabloid papers. I don't think it's negative when you take the SNP policy that they will not talk about divorce from the United Kingdom. That's just if we that's raise rubbish. it, if we raise it, surely in a democracy, yeah. we should be spelling out to people in Scotland what the consequences well, are. Well, if that's negative, we've certainly been doing it, but I think we've been doing an invaluable yeah. service to this Henry debate McLeish, in the do, process of Do you think, Henry McLeish, do you think that in years to come, You'll be proud of that um, party political broadcast that Labour put out at the start of this campaign, which was one of the most negative party political broadcasts we've seen. We are, we are committed. We are, no, we are committed. No, I, no, I, no, I, no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't criticise it because if you, if you've looked at the programme that we've adopted, we had a very positive campaign oh, about policies. And if you take the five yeah. pledges, if you take the five pledges, yes, which are closest to the interests of the Scottish people, we are talking about drugs. We're talking about apprenticeships, we're talking about education, we're talking about health, and we're talking about no tax rises. These are very positive issues that we've been involved in day in, day out. And what I would say to the SNP is simply this. If it's such an important event that on May the 7th, if you have an SNP majority, you're going to file for divorce, why was it then only the 11th pledge tucked away in 37 pages which said we'll have a referendum during the four years. It's been a dishonest campaign, John, and we have every right as a party to expose Why you. Why wasn't it right at the top? Well, well, you know, you've heard the pejorative language of Henry McLeish, which has underpinned the whole election campaign the Labour Party has fought. What we've done. What we've, what we've done in this election campaign has been very clear. We have concentrated on the Parliament that the people of Scotland voted in a referendum to elect. And we've set out a policy programme that relates to the devolved functions of the Scottish Parliament, all the areas of policy that can be influenced by the Parliament. And we've said to people, if you want to move on, if you want to have some further change, we can have a referendum on independence if that's the wish of the Scottish people. What the Labour Party has done is try to run away from the responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament, hide behind, hide behind uh, control of their campaign from London, and to put forward a programme that has been so thin on the ground and attacks that have been so ferocious, so vicious, that they have, the, the Labour Party should be ashamed of David, And David what we will see is a positive response from the people in this election. At the, at, the, at the start of this election, Jim Wallace said it was very important that we didn't allow the voices of the loudest 
to drown out those who talk most common sense. And I think the electorate is going to resist allowing that to happen. And I think the second vote is all important. Everybody should remember that. And I hope that Mr. Sheridan, and indeed someone from the Green Party, actually gets elected to this parliament so that it represents the whole breadth of Scottish public opinion. I, re I really believe that's important. When it, when it comes, when it comes to uh, the seventh I'm of not May. saying you're going to form a coalition with them. But. Well, well, you know, you're not going to say that, but tell me, people want to know what, what, the really policies, exactly. what policies are the most precious to you. Are all policies up for negotiation when it comes to um, a, a possible coalition? Yes, but the most, the, uh, we, yes? we've, already said, we've already said that health and education are the two priorities. And if I may pick up so something Annabelle said. So tuition fees are not up for tuition grabs. Fees, tuition fees is the most important example I can give you of something that will definitely happen in the new parliament, if Labour fails to get an overall majority, there will not be a parliamentary majority for maintaining tuition fees. They will go, whether it's a minority government or a coalition. On your shopping list, if I can ask you on your shopping list, I have a shopping list. Well, okay. I have a manifesto, and the more the, manif the more of the manifesto will go in, the more Liberal Democrats are elected. That's all we can say at the but moment. But can you say, if as a veteran of a uh, Lib Lab pack before, will you be looking for a minister in every department? We haven't even begun to think about that. That's not the issue. The issue is not who sits in what seats. The issue is what policies are going to be pursued by the Scottish right. Parliament. The more Liberal Democrats we have, the more of our manifesto will be in the government programme. Uh, anyway, if you do not reach the magic number of a majority of 65, say you get around 60, do you think you will be minded to go it alone and see what happens rather than reach out a hand to a particular party? Well, I think like David, Kirsty, first of all, our focus is on the next seven days. But clearly, on the night of the election and the day after, we'll have to look at what the state of the parties is. And I think it'd be very strange if we were now to be starting discussing on this programme yeah. what the details might be um, of any consultations with anyone uh, after May the 7th. But I think it's important to reinforce David's point. This is a unique election for us, uh, the first one in 300 years for the Scottish General Election. The public will decide. And when we're talking about PR, for example, which was raised, this is fascinating because, in a sense, we built that into the Scotland Act. We know that it can have some predictions which are not, you know, forecastable. And so, therefore, on May the 7th, Scotland will have a chance to reflect on the votes they've made. And I think all the parties should wait until that particular point to decide what they would want to do next. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, with that, we will move on to a question from Jim Fitzsimmons, who's a redundant miner. Your question, please. Since the closure of the mines in our area, which is a Cumnock area, no party seems to have eased their unemployment status. Now the highest in Britain. Are any of the you don't think any candidates party is the policy. are capable of doing something about it or helping us? Are the Conservatives capable of helping unemployment? This is a particularly bad area, but unemployment is high. Put it out. <coughs> well, I think it goes back to the point I made earlier that the whole key to trying to solve unemployment and try and minimise the consequences that are so grievous following unemployment are to create a good economy, try and get new industry in, try and keep new industry here. And I think the best we can offer is that you would create a stable, healthy Scottish economy. Now, as going back to taxes, we don't think you'll do that by varying the tax rate, by making Scotland more highly taxed than the rest of the United Kingdom. But presumably the question is, you would have rather the mines hand closed. You think there was a viable reason for keeping the mines open? Oh, I, Margaret decided they were to be closed, and that was it, dear. Margaret just... decided they were to be closed, and that was it. <laughs> Annabelle Goldie, was, was Margaret Thatcher wrong to make the decision to close the mines? I don't think Margaret Thatcher made the decision to close the mines. Well, the Conservatives. You'd have caught it when you say you don't think Margaret Thatcher made the decision. <laughs> Come on. I say that I think, I think the prevailing economic climate at the time made the decision, the future demand for coal made the decision, and the competitiveness of the mining industry that existed made the decision. No, you created the demand for less coal. Your party created the demand for less coal, dear. Right. Um, Henry McLeish's latest CBI survey says manufacturing is at its lowest level for 20 years and is contracting very fast. You know, we take the, the, the particular problem for this area, we take the uncertainty for this area, and we say that manufacturing is contracting, and Scotland's in a very bad position. Well, if we look across unemployment, first of all, I think all the panel would agree that unemployment, no matter where it exists, in my constituency in Kilmarnock, is something we've got to tackle very, very seriously. But are the policies right for Scotland? I think the policies are, and if I could just explain where I think we've got to, 
One of the intentions after the election was to make sure within the United Kingdom we had some sound public finances. We're now seeing that in terms of inflation, in terms of interest rates, which is good for the stability. But I think what we've got to address now is what we can do within the Scottish Parliament to address some of those issues. What our party is suggesting is this. First of all, we've got to reinforce the skills base. Everywhere I go, people want to see apprenticeships. That's why we want 20,000. 20, Secondly, we have got an investment programme in our health service and in education which will deliver 5,000 care workers, 5,000 classroom assistants, 10,000 construction yes, Henry, workers. Henry, so Henry, that's, the time that's is important. too strong and that's, interest rates are twice the European average. That does not help manufacturing yes, yes, in this country. The point is the sound financial... The sound financial basis that I've outlined is the best bet for the future. That's absolutely right. But what we've got to do, if we're taking this Parliament seriously, we've got to look at, for example, youth unemployment has been halved under New Deal. 7,000 young Scots now in a productive job. We're talking about apprenticeships. We're talking about the creation of 100,000 new businesses over 10 years. There is no magic right. wand that you can John, wave, Kirsty. John, but this that's is an international, program international for the conditions and, in fact, the SNP wouldn't be in any better position, for example, to keep the mines open, never mind doing anything beyond what Henry McLeish is doing. Well, there's obviously international conditions that affect particular enterprises, and the Caverna situation is one example of that. But, you know, you cannot look at the economy of Scotland just now and say that we've got the right economic medicine. We have uh, high interest rates, double the, the level in the European zone where most of our competitors are. I was at uh, a company in Cumbernauld today talking to me about the difficulties of a 30% appreciation in sterling and what that does to their competitiveness and their ability to export. Uh, you go around Scotland seeing businesses that are trying their best to make their way in the world, but they find that the Chancellor's medicine, designed to suit economic conditions well, in the southeast of England, where there is overheating, where there hasn't been in Scotland, right. we're getting medicine dished out to Scotland, which we don't need, we don't require, and unemployment well, in Scotland is still going up when it's going down in the rest of John the United Swinney, Kingdom. Uh, and that's a disaster answer? for Scotland. Yeah. I would like... Before I go to the audience this point, I'd just like to, ask, to answer Jim Fitzsimmons' point. Would the SNP have kept the mines open and how much would it have cost you? Well, if you actually, if you look at the circumstances that happened to the mining industry, you know, a disaster that happened over 15 years ago, uh, you saw a, a whole sequence of policy changes being undertaken in terms of the switch to nuclear power in relation to the diversion to, into imported coal to, uh, to, to inappropriate policies in terms of investment in the coal industry. Those were the symptoms of disaster and they were wreaked on Scotland by the Conservative so government and Annabelle cannot escape the responsibility for the economic conditions, Look, just like Gordon Brown can't escape the, but, the, the responsibility you, for the so economic Swinney, conditions that he's inflicting on Scotland. Would you have kept that mine open Thank for you. that gentleman? Well, what is important? No, never mind. No, 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 what's important? No, what's important? <laughs> what's important is that people in Scotland are aware that the prevailing so economic win. conditions in Scotland have been put upon us by a government that is focusing on the south of England economy and the conditions that exist there and that don't exist here. David Steele, I, I, I want to say three things quickly on the subject. First of all, the gentleman is right. We all know that the Tory government under Margaret Thatcher had a prejudice against the mines and the railways and we suffered from, from the lack of investment. But, but, but what we can't do is go back and say, well, if we'd been there, we'd have done things differently and so on and so on. We're within the situation we are in now. Now, the Scottish Parliament is limited by one thing. It cannot control what will be the decision on joining the euro. And one of the things that would get the economy really moving again would be a clear commitment from the government that they are going to join the euro and that we would stop suffering the extra interest rates and the high value of the pound. And the third thing I want to say is that I am absolutely convinced... But if it doesn't regardless come, that's of the, an argument for independence. Finish, the third point I'm making is that regardless of the political composition of the parliament, I'm very optimistic from the discussions that I've had overseas that the very effect of the Scottish Parliament is going to be to galvanise much more economic activity here as it has done in Catalonia since the Parliament was but resolved. But is that not an argument? Is that not an argument for stronger powers to the Scottish Parliament? Of course, I'm wanting, I want as much power as we can get to the Scottish Parliament. I don't believe in separation and independence, that's not necessary, but let the Scottish Parliament flex its muscles once it's there. Well, it's straight out to the audience now. We'll, yes, we'll the Green Party in the front row, Mrs Coyne talk as if unemployment is inevitable. We don't believe there's any need for unemployment in Scotland in the future if we direct our economic policies appropriately. And some of the ways the Greens think we could restore employment to Scotland is by a massive programme of home insulation so everyone lives in a warm house in Scotland, reinstating our once proud rail network throughout the country, 
converting farming practices so that organic agriculture is promoted and reforesting takes place and putting an emphasis on local businesses instead of being tied into global economics. You come and join and my party. <laughs> 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 Behind, the gentleman behind, please. Can I ask the panel, Kirsty, what plans they would have to reduce the transportation costs that we have in Scotland? As we are in the periphery of Scotland, how can we keep Scottish industry competitive with the taxation costs that we have at the moment? Right, the gentleman behind now, please. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, John Swinney uh, was asked a question by a working man. He's trying to come across uh, as a friend of the working man. Uh, he hasn't answered the question, but what I would like to ask John Swinney is, if he's such a friend of the working man, why didn't he and his colleagues sit in the House of Commons and vote through the national minimum wage? John Swinney. John Swinney. Well, yeah, the SNP has made quite clear its support for the national minimum wage, and at different stages of the parliamentary process we have voted for the national minimum wage, and that's part of the parliamentary record. Can I address the point the gentleman raised there about, uh, about the situation in relation to transportation costs? Because in rural areas of Scotland and throughout the Scottish economy, there is now a punitive burden being applied onto companies and individuals, where in rural areas there's absolutely no alternative but to use cars, where people's the price of goods are going up in our shops, and that's a tax put on Scotland by the Labour Chancellor without a second thought for the impact on the Scottish economy. And what we've got to do in the Scottish Parliament, and I hope the uh, different parties that voted against the fuel duty, and I was there on Tuesday night to vote against the fuel duty increases in the House of Commons, will come together and make sure we maximise the pressure on the Chancellor to make sure there is not a further single increase in the fuel duty escalator or an application, because it will be a disaster for the rural areas, rural areas of Scotland if that is applied. Do you agree with that, David Steele? I do, but I also think... I think, I think we need to go a stage further. I think the new parliament's got to get, get to grips with the oil companies and stop them putting extra prices onto the rural areas because they're the ones that are hardest hit but after the government, that. The government stop, is, the government stop the escalator now. I, I think we should, yes. Stop I think it's gone far now. enough. It's gone far enough. I take a litre of diesel, for instance. It's 51 pence <laughs> tax. That's right. A litre of diesel costs about 9, 10 pence to produce. It's not the oil companies that are making the money. It's the government that sees us as a rich, dripping road. Annabelle Gordy, do you say stop the escalator now? Annabelle Gordy, do you say stop the escalator now? I mean, an escalator means there is a top point. We think the top point has been gone over, and we think the, po the, the point has been reached where your industry, your industry is in free fall with disastrous consequences. Orbit. I mean, the Tories have said in their manifesto they are more than sympathetic to the freight industry. We've promised a whole raft of road improvements. We do feel that what's been happening in terms of imposition of petrol tax to a country like Scotland, we can't help our geography. We can't help the fact that we have remote areas <laughs> served only by roads. We think we're being penalised by this we're government. Also, and we're also not a rich country as well. Uh, Henry McLeish, they, this may turn out to be one of the most unpopular policies that your party has to defend during this election. Yeah. Well, I think, Kirsty, what, what I would say is that, first of all, if we take the uh, fuel and the um, situation that's been described, that's certainly still a matter uh, for Westminster. But I think it's got to be looked at in the round in relation to transportation. You're a government minister. You have it in your power. Well, we don't have it within our power in the Scottish Parliament. Kirsten. Well, is that well, our problem? Well, exactly. well, well, no, because it's the matter it's that's been problem. agreed in the Scotland Act. So what was the problem? Can I ask Can I ask a situation, Henry, in the Scottish Parliament in due course, that the Chancellor is going through his pre-budget consultation, will you join with the three parties that voted against the fuel duty escalator on Tuesday night and lobby the Labour Chancellor in London not to apply a fuel duty escalator in the future. We've undertaken at the present time and we're involved. But will you do that? Will you do something different? Will you do something different? Just wait a minute, John. We will always want, we will always want in the Scottish Parliament to consider issues which are coming to us from people and organisations in Scotland. The Parliament will, no, John, that's unfair. The Parliament will not have it as a devolved responsibility, but there is no doubt that the Parliament will be discussing with Westminster and expressing their views. And of course, the Labour Party will be listening and responding. But Kirsty, let me also say that but trans will you, will transportation, you not to apply that transportation, to transportation is one of the biggest issues facing Scotland. Thank you very much, I'm afraid. About something we'll we've wait, got we'll to, wait to see if you're at the top of the escalator. Uh, moving on now to question five, and it comes from Margaret Cook, who's a retired nursing sister. If you were marooned on Ailsa Craig, who in Scottish politics would you choose to keep you company and why? 
Who in Scottish politics would you choose to keep you company, if anybody, and why? Annabel Goldie. It would have to be somebody from the Green Party so it would survive, I think. <laughs> Well, I think I would say, and it's, it's interesting because it's a follow-on from the previous question, and maybe I could do some use when, he's, when I'm talking to him, would be the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And the reason for that is not so much to discuss taxation policy or the fuel ex uh, escalator, would be to look at Scottish football. Gordon Thanks. Brown, the Chancellor, is an expert on that, and quite frankly, that would be a good combination on a desert island, at least for a small bit of time. Thank you very much indeed. Let's pick up some people from the audience here. If you were on the heels of Craig, who would you have with you? Yes, the man at the second front row, first of all. I wouldn't like to be marooned there myself, but I'd be rather tempted to maroon Tony Blair with Sonny Bean. Right. <laughs> 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 I would say any MSP who would be willing to travel down the M77 to get to you oh, and try and survive imagine. it. And the young woman on the left? It would definitely have to be someone from the Green Party so that Ailsa Craig wasn't polluted as the rest of Scotland's were coming. Thank you very much indeed. And the gentleman with the spectacles on, yes? I think we should put all the government ministers on Ailsa Craig and tell them how to speak with a Scottish accent again. Right. The gentleman up the back of the audience, yes? I'd like to be marooned with you, Kirsty. <laughs> The gentleman uh, uh, there with his, uh, the young man with the shirt and tie and spectacles, yep. I reckon it would definitely have to be Dennis Canavan to try and get him out on new Labour's hair because they obviously can't cope with them themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and also Mr Fitzsimmons. It'd have to be the guy that uh, made the logo for the Labour Party. I've always, the Scottish Labour Party we are always, I think we should send him out there and leave him. That's <laughs> fair. Well, I, I want to make a claim which I don't think anyone else will deny, and that is I'm the only politician who is here who's actually been on Ailsa Craig. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I left it without any other company. There you are. And you'd rather just have yourself a company? No, 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 I'm not as selfish as that. <laughs> 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 no, I would take somebody who could sing. But certainly not someone to make a coalition with. No, no, someone who could sing. Somebody who could sing. Yeah. John Twitty, if you had your opportunity to choose any Scottish politician to take to Ailsa Craig, who would it be? I think I'd have to say after what seems like an eternity on the Scottish campaign trail, I couldn't bear to be on anyone else on Ailsa, with any other politician on Ailsa Craig after the amount of time I've spent on politicians' panels like this yeah. in the last number of months. Not even Alex Salmon. Oh, no, no. Well, I think, uh, I think, um, <laughs> I think uh, Alec, would, uh, uh, Alec wouldn't be able to go to Ailsa Craig because it's not a golf course for him to uh, indulge in his, uh, his favourite pastime of golfing. So, uh, and it wouldn't interest me much to be in the golf course on Ailsa Craig either. Thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid that is it from Kilmarnock. Next week I'll be with the four party leaders and an audience of 500 live in Edinburgh. It promises to be an exciting event as it will be the last time the leaders will meet before polling day. Join me with Donald Dewar, Jim Wallace, Alex Salmond and David McCletchie at 5 past 10 on Tuesday night. From all of us in Kilmarnock, a very good night. I've covered eight general elections.